Hello and welcome to the Cambridge Festival and I'm absolutely delighted to be here today with my esteemed colleagues who I will introduce to you in a moment. But today we're here to talk about precision medicine and chronic diseases. So what I'll do is I'll just start by uh, letting my colleagues introduce themselves and then we'll get going with the conversation. Okay. Richard, over to you. Uh, good afternoon. So I'm Richard Kennedy. I'm the Global Vice President and Medical Director at Almac Diagnostic Services. So my role is to look after clinical testing internationally, so that's in our UK and US sites, and I have oversight also in our Chinese testing labs. So at any one time I'm looking after between 20 and 30 clinical trials at several hundred clinical sites. Okay. Owen, over to you. Uh, my name is Owen McKinney. I'm the versus arthritis professor of rheumatology in the University of Cambridge. I am also a clinician, consultant clinician in, in Addenbrooke's Hospital, working in autoimmune and inflammatory diseases, most of them chronic. Um, and my role in the university is really with an interest in applying genomic methods, so making lots of measurements on biological samples from human uh, subjects with, with a range of different diseases to try and work out what causes those diseases, how we can better measure them, and how we can better predict their course in the future to improve treatment. Great. George. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm George Mells. I'm a consultant hepatologist here at uh, Adam Brooks. Um, but, uh, and my clinical interest is in the management of autoimmune liver diseases. Um, but I'm also... Um, I'm part of a research project known as UKPBC, uh, which aims to generate and deliver precision medicine for a liver disease known as primary biliary cholangitis. Brilliant. And Adam. Hi, everybody. My name's Adam Platt. I'm Vice President of Translational Science and Experimental Medicine for Respiratory and Immunology at AstraZeneca. We work everything from identifying new targets all the way through to phase three and life cycle. A lot of it is, as I say, identifying new targets, identifying new biomarkers, and particularly those new patient groups which are going to make us uh, enable precision medicine in chronic disease. And my name is Maria Orr, um, and I'm the head of precision medicine for biopharmaceuticals within AstraZeneca. So it's a great pleasure for me to be here and to lead this discussion today because precision medicine, I think, is something that's very dear to all of our hearts. So what I'd like to do is just start today by asking, what does precision medicine mean to you? What's, what is it all about for you? And what are the things that are critical and when you're thinking about how you're going to apply precision medicine? So Richard, let me start with you first. Yeah, as, as opposed to the sort of the textbook definition, mm -hmm. that'll be the right patient, right time, right drug. Um, that certainly has been my background is oncology. So that was very much the way we were trained when we were, when we were uh, medical school. And, um, we had something as simple as the estrogen receptor for tamoxifen. Yeah, we understood that. But uh, I think now we're seeing that there's a, a, ch a shift, certainly we're seeing an AMAC now, into other diseases outside oncology and, and hematology as well. Um, really, over the last three years, we've seen about half of what we deliver now will be in chronic disease. And it's probably an increasing appreciation that in chronic disease, but like cancer, not every disease is the same. So the one size fits all the way we would originally have given treatments probably is no longer appropriate, particularly when we understand the biology better, which helps us subset disease. But that has its challenges as well, which I'm sure we'll get into today. <laughs> we certainly will. We certainly will. I'm actually going to come to Adam next, just to give your perspective. And the reason I do that is because we've got um, Richard giving his sort of diagnostics perspective. Now let's think about it from the pharma side, and then we'll come to our clinical colleagues. A lot of the diseases we work on, such as asthma, COPD, rheumatoid arthritis, atopic dermatitis, they're very heterogeneous diseases. So they're probably more syndromes rather than actually disease themselves. So by trying to understand the biology which underpins these syndromes, we can try and impact which patients are actually driven by which mechanisms. And this then allows us to target therapeutics to that particular mechanism and increase, uh, increase the probability that if you give a patient that drug, they're gonna to respond to that drug. So, so really to answer your question, that's what it means from my perspective at least. Fantastic. So a nice alignment between our diagnostic aspirations and our drug aspirations. So now let's think about it from the clinical side. Owen, what, what does it mean for you? So I would sort of define it in, in a, as a continuum mm -hmm. because precision medicine is not one thing. We know that people who get a disease Two people with the same disease can have quite different experiences. They can have a different mm -hmm. manifestations of that disease, different symptoms. They can have different outcomes. So we, we all know that. But if we break precision medicine down, it can break 
that apparently homogenous group of patients with a disease into stratified medicine, where we can break it into two groups of people with more similar diseases, mm -hmm. and perhaps go beyond that into precision medicine, where we can move into finer resolution of subgroups of patients with diseases. And then if you push it even further, we can get into personalized medicine, yes. where actually then we're talking about what disease do you have? What does the actual individual in front of me have? And therefore, what is the right treatment for this person? Not necessarily the subgroup of the disease, but for this actual individual. And as Adam points out, that's not at all dissociated from the mechanisms that actually cause and drive the disease in the first place. Because there are lots of different ways in which, for example, your immune system can go wrong to give you a set of symptoms. Uh, and the way in which it goes wrong, the mechanism of that disease can dictate what is the right treatment for you. So I think if, if we can understand precision medicine, we at the same time push forward mechanistic understanding of disease and how to get better treatments as well. Fantastic. And we're going to be delving into those <laughs> subjects quite a bit as we move forward. So, uh, George, but what about from your perspective? Um, from the hepatology perspective, actually, the starting point would be to have a few more drugs at all. Yeah. Um, <laughs> there are very few treatment options available in hep hepatology. Um, but, but for me, precision medicine actually means overcoming a real problem that we have, which is the one-size-fits-all approach, mm -hmm. which is to say that if we're treating, for example, a condition like autoimmune hepatitis, then every single patient will start with, for example, prednisolone associated with many, many side effects, and they will all receive prednisolone for a minimum of one year. Okay, and a very simple, uh, which as I say is associated with a very significant side effect burden. Um, a very, very simple question which can be, um, which can be uh, addressed by precision medicine is whether all of those patients need that dose of prednisolone for that duration. Um, if in fact there are some patients who do not, then of course you save a very significant proportion of patients from that, um, from that side effect burden. Um, so, so for me, precision medicine means sparing a patients yeah. mm -hmm. um, the side effects of unnecessary treatments mm -hmm. and delivering uh, much more effective uh, treatments uh, to patients who need them. Fantastic. And already there's lots of topics that are popping out for us to sort of follow on in the discussions. So let's sort of now move to the next level because I think what we all appreciate is that precision medicine has made a big impact in the field of oncology. And we've seen some fantastic approaches there. We've seen wonderful drugs that are targeted with diagnostic tests where you can identify those patients, get them to the treatments that they need. And we've seen really great advances, I think. And lung cancer, I think, is a wonderful example of that. You know, where we've seen that we were looking at that by the pathology of the tissue that you were looking at, and now we're looking at really sort of segmenting that based on the molecular diagnosis. So we've seen fantastic movements in the oncology field, but we're here today because we want to talk about other chronic diseases, and we want to say, what's it going to take to create the same kind of revolution, I suppose, in the way that we're doing treatments in chronic diseases as we've seen in oncology. So feel free to, to sort of speak about oncology experiences as well, but say, what, what, what do we think we need to do in order to move this same paradigm into chronic diseases? So, oh, let me start with you with that one. Thanks. Um, it's a great comparison, and I think it's probably worth acknowledging up front that oncology have made great strides forward. They've still got a way to go and are still working yeah. hard on it in the way that the rest of us are, but uh, they are often held up as a paradigm, and rightly so. Um, there are a few differences between the way oncology is treated and diagnosed that are different from other chronic diseases, and I think that is a difference that, that's worth bringing out. So for if you're unlucky enough to end up with the diagnosis of a cancer, there is a defined point where that is diagnosed, where the, the, the bad news is broken to you. You then go on, you have your tests, you get your diagnosis, you go on and begin your treatment. That isn't quite as clear cut in all conditions. You may have grumbling symptoms for years that have multiple treatments tried out before you finally get a concrete diagnosis and move on with other treatments and somewhere along that slightly more diffuse pathway precision medicine has to work out what the right thing to do is so because it's less well defined it's less amenable to us collecting the right data or the right samples that can facilitate us 
working out what the best precision medicine strategies are. So I think that's a key difference that, that separates other diseases apart and perhaps makes it a little bit harder in the context of other chronic uh, diseases than it is in cancer. Yeah. And, and George, yeah. from your perspective? Well, I'd agree with all of that, but um, I'm going to take a slightly more sort of uh, speak from a, a statistical or an epidemiological perspective, actually, and say that really what, uh, what is required is sample size. Um, what we need is the, the largest research cohorts that we can muster um, in order to derive power uh, to identify subgroups of disease. We need vast amounts of clinical data, um, which we should be analyzing using novel techniques such as machine learning and artificial intelligence in order to identify the different subtypes of disease that you refer to. And then, of course, we need to be able to collect a multitude of samples which can be analysed on all of the different platforms that are available to us in order to, um, to undertake the phenotypic stratification which is needed um, to divide patients into these different subgroups who may respond differently to different treatments, who may have different uh, disease trajectories and so on. Uh, the bottom line, we need people, we need patients, patients with the condition, we need clinicians to be enrolling patients in research trials, and we need patients to want to participate in them. Yeah, fantastic. And Adam, I'm going to move to you, because I know that machine learning is a subject that's dear to your heart, but also in the translational science field, of course, trying to identify some of these uh, biomarkers associated Absolutely. with those phenotypes is also due to your heart. So, so where, what's your thinking around this and chronic? So, so, I, so I think it all starts really with the biomarker, and we were agnostic to what the biomarker should be. To be honest, it could be the length of your toenails if we could measure it accurately and reproducible. <laughs> so, uh, but the important thing is. It's also. I think we've been a little bit seduced by oncology, if you'll forgive me, because. It's relatively easy there, but the target is generally the biomarker. Yeah. And that doesn't work for common disease. So if you look at IL-6 therapies for rheumatoid arthritis, if you measure IL-6, that accounts about 1% of the variation in response. So there's something a bit different there to start with. And then I think there's something about where you actually access the biomarker from. So we've done a lot of work around CPD, which is great and met needs, still the third uh, uh, leading cause of death. Uh, in the developed world, and um, we, we find that if we measure gene expression changes in the lung, you see about 500 genes aberrantly expressed, whether they're up or down, compared to healthy controls. If you look at blood from the same patients, you see about five. So that tells us we need to be able to get to the, the lung. But of course, if you're going to prescribe a new therapy to a COPD patient, you can't go ripping pieces of lung out of, there, of them every time you want a new therapy. So it's a case we need to find a way to identify um, how to access the target tissue without actually asking, accessing the target tissue to make it more amenable. And, and I think that's where oncology has a bit of an advantage, actually. Yeah, yeah, couldn't agree more. And, and actually, it's good to bring in the sort of diagnostic perspective a little bit, as well as the clinical perspective yeah. on some of this. So, so and, and I completely agree with that. Um, with, with oncology, I think we did have it relatively easy because I think so when you measure a BRCA1 gene, it's mutant, you respond to a drug. And that was all very clear. And it's very easy for us to develop an assay in that space. But then we move to something like um, asthma, where there's maybe over 100 uh, single nuclear polymorphisms described. We move to coronary artery disease, 300 we've discovered, each of them with a little tiny effect. And uh, to create that, then you're into polygenics. Um, and then once you've done that, it's not entirely sure how these genes relate to mechanism as well. Some may be related to the mechanism of the drug, some may not. Some may not even regulate, a or some may be regulating a gene rather than be in a gene. So that can be difficult to relate back to function. And then we're into, and then actually quite a lot of these genes may not even be in a coding region at all. So we're now into what this sort of what they call like the dark matter of the genome, that's sort of 95%, which nobody's entirely sure what it does. But for us diagnostically, that's actually a, a bit of a, a difficult area to be in because you've got these areas called repeats in this area. And this makes the current technologies we use diagnostically, such as next generation sequencing, a real challenge. So the technology's probably not quite there for those kind of biomarkers. On top of that, then data sets that have been, rec that have been stored in the past tend to be done at a coding level. Mm -hmm. So it tends to be the exome, the coding part, where we have the information. So there's a lot of information missing for us to go back and reference to. So it's just very technically challenging. Um, that on top of the technologies and actually having technologies available in the hospitals to be able to deliver these as well. Mm -hmm. So you know, there's a lot of interest in new technologies, even the old technologies are not readily available in a lot of hospitals. So there's, there's those sort of challenges have to be overcome. Um, and actually just education. 
So uh, in oncology, we, uh, with training, part of when I was trained as a registrar, we were expected to understand the molecular biology of, of cancer. <laughs> um, but that's not typically, I think it's fair to say, it's not typically the training in other disciplines. So there's a bit of maybe education in some disciplines, obviously, with the, <laughs> the panelists accepted, obviously, that's your area. But there's, in, in general medicine, it's probably not such an emphasis on the importance of molecular biology and how it underpins disease. So that probably needs to change as well for acceptance. Mm. So I think it's pretty, some of the challenges. Yeah. There's, there's probably one other yeah. key thing I would stress, whereas um, I said that in a context of oncology, you have a defined starting point. Mm -hmm. There's also a very well-defined end point. Correct. Yeah. If it comes back, it's come back, and that there's broad consensus. Yeah. Or another end point, unfortunately, is often patients dying, and that's very clean and obvious yeah. and recordable. It's not always the case in chronic diseases. You know, do they have a relapse or not? Yeah. Yeah. Defining that or getting agreement across many doctors for what actually constitutes the right outcome isn't as straightforward or as clear cut. Um, and I think that's a lesson we can get from oncology that we have to improve our consensus agreement over what are the important endpoints. Sometimes what the, cl the patient feels, how they feel, can be quite different to what their tests show or how their investigations look. And if those things don't agree, it's hard to combine those together into a very clear endpoint that we should then be measuring yeah. in that disease. So um, I think we can learn from oncology and trying to get better agreement amongst ourselves because only when we know what it is we should be measuring can we find better ways of measuring. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's even worse, isn't it, in a lot of things like autoimmune disease where you get to clinical endpoints. Yeah. Yeah. Because then if we're trying to deconvolute the heterogeneity of disease and you're recombining it by having a composite endpoint, bringing in different mm -hmm. clinical manifestations, you're probably again confounding your, your issue for a second time. Very noisy, absolutely. Yeah. 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 So there's certainly plenty of challenges, and I think we're going to touch on some of these in a little bit more detail as we go through. But I want to return actually to a point that George raised, which was actually when we start the search, I suppose, for how we define the patient subgroups and and how we might be able to find those wonderful biomarkers that we might like to use, akin to the ones that we use in oncology. You touched on the fact that we need to have access to really good. Uh, sample sets, we need to have access to really good data that goes alongside those uh, sample sets. So I guess maybe one of the things that we could just touch on is, is where do we think we are? Um, are we good enough at doing that now? Do we need to do more in this space? Uh, if so, what should we be doing to be able to make sure that we can actually understand some of these chronic diseases that we want to work on and also identify the, the, those wonderful biomarkers that will help us define who we should be treating and who we shouldn't. So, um, George, maybe maybe over to you as you, you raised it initially as an important mm. topic. <coughs> yes. Um, <clears throat> uh, a slightly biased view on this. Uh, <laughs> um, so, I work entirely with livers. Um, now, we actually have a very easily defined endpoint, which is that the liver tests have to return to normal. So, that makes life easy. And we also measure a lot of... Um, uh, we do a lot of serial measurements, so mm -hmm. the patients will come to clinic on a regular basis. They'll have the same set of tests done on a regular basis. They'll have ultrasound scans done. They'll have fibro scans done and so on. All of this is correct, collected as serial measurements over a long period of time. Um, and we can use all of that in order to identify disease trajectories and so on and so forth. So, <clears throat> so I think for us, endpoints are, are relatively simple, actually. Um, but in order to identify these different subgroups of disease who may uh, respond differently to different treatments and have different needs for different treatments, we need all of those serial data to be collected from very large numbers of patients. And that's what we're trying to do as part of this project, this UK PBC. We're trying to mobilize all of the routinely collected clinical information about a very large population of patients. So my biased view on this is that no, we're not doing well. <laughs> because there are very few hospitals in the country, unfortunately, who can provide you with a data extract consisting yeah. of all of that serial data. And this is extremely disappointing because yeah. this is information that we collect entirely routinely. We've been doing so for, for, for years and years and years since, for example, uh, the standard liver tests became available. Yeah which is decades ago. Um, so a, a wealth of information available in hospitals across the country. And yet we, can't, we haven't even got the means of accessing that. 
Um, and, and this is ridiculous, actually, because that clinical information provides you with an enormous amount of detail, even before you begin um, to start uh, the various, uh, the, the, the phenotyping on various, the molecular characterization using the different platforms that are available uh, nowadays. Uh, so, so my view is no, and we need to do better. Good. And, and Owen, your perspective on that as well? So I'd agree with most of what George said. Um, I think we could definitely do better, but it's probably, pardon me, it's probably worth putting into context where, where we were mm -hmm. and where we are now. Uh, we used to, when you turned up in hospital, write down on a piece of paper, <laughs> shove it into what amounted to a ring binder uh, <laughs> and stick that in a, in a slot. We used to carry x-rays, look at them up against the light and then <laughs> stick it into a folder. We don't do that anymore. Uh, the electronic health record has been a revolution and has drastically improved our ability to extract information at scale from the population when they come to the health service. And that has huge potential for our ability to better characterize and identify these subgroups of disease. Now, I'm not saying that does not require more improvement. Yeah. It does, and that's not a simple task. The electronic health record system is not joined up in the UK, for Correct. example. We can't even talk to other hospitals down the road if, uh, as effectively as we should. So we can get better, but we are a lot better than we used to be mm -hmm. at collecting the data uh, on, on someone's journey, if you like, from getting sick to, to getting treatment. Samples is the other side, yeah. uh, and there we have way further to go. Yeah. Um, collecting samples for your tests when you go to hospital is one thing, collecting them for research so that we can learn what yeah. other things we should be measuring that we're not currently measuring is quite different. And work, that requires us to work together to get sample sets at scale on large enough numbers of patients so that we can discover what the right things we should be measuring are. That sounds easy. It's not. Yeah. Uh, so working together across different geographies, across different countries, with different protocols to actually standardize the way we collect samples, what samples we collect, uh, and to link that to the clinical information is, is not an easy challenge. But I, I think there's cause for optimism. We're doing it better than we used to do it. And, and I think that the trajectory is at least in the right direction for that. Yeah, that's good. And, and Adam, I'll, I'll come to you as well, because I know that obviously when we think about this in the context of clinical trials as well, access to quality data, but also the samples, you know, as sure. Owen has pointed out, you know, what are the sort of challenges we face when we're trying to get access to, to those samples and then utilize them to be able to do the kind of research that we need to do? Oh, absolutely. And of course, the key is to start with uh, well-consented patients, yeah. which allow you to protect the patient's rights, but still do uh, having a breadth of research to be able to get meaningful data out of it. Um, it, it really is the bread and butter of a lot of what we do at AstraZeneca is um, uh, joining with people externally to get these big cohorts, bring them together. And, and in fact, we actually sequence um, everybody who consents from our clinical studies now at AstraZeneca. So that's producing database. And I think things like UK Biobank over recent years, we've been part of a consortium to sequence UK Biobank. So now almost 500,000 patients have their exome sequenced and whole genomes are following on. It's an amazing resource that is allowing us to discover genes which are associated with particular phenotypes, particular diseases, which are going to represent new targets, new biomarkers, new, new subgroups for, to enable precision medicine. But I totally agree with both what you're saying. There's, there's an awfully long way to go, but we have made a lot of progress, in, certainly in the last five years, for sure. Yeah, it's I think, sorry, the other thing I'll say as well um, is, I think what you, you said earlier about machine learning is absolutely important here as well, because you get different cohorts where you've connect, yeah. collected different measures. And uh, there are various methods in machine learning now which can take that whole picture, compare it to another cohort, and predict which, which parts of the data are missing get an overall joined up cohort. And I think that's really exciting. It's something we're starting to explore, but I don't think we're quite there yet. Yeah, so the power, the power of samples and the power of data is, is really important. Richard, your perspective on this as well. Yeah, I agree with a lot, lot of what's been said. Um, one thing we're very wary of is the sort of applicability of the data that's been collected to be, to be used prospectively for patients. So what I mean by that, sir, for us, I guess, there's from the genomics perspective, there's two main sources. There's sort of real world data, where there's been maybe a health service wide kind of collection of clinical data, or there may be clinical trial based, which is a little different. In the, in the sort of real world data, quite often what we'll see is missing data, and we have to find ways to deal with that. Or clinicians, if it hasn't been a standardized way of collecting data, like one clinician might write bronchopneumonia, somebody else might write 
pneumonia, somebody else might write chest infection, and you've got to have methods to try to collate all that data and make it readable. Um, the, the other thing too is if you take the real world data, a lot of the time it'll have been historic and things move on. So diagnosis standards will change and what you think might have been, a, well, what it might have been called one stage of a disease a few years ago has right. now stage shifted just purely because of the way of diagnosing a disease has shifted. Mm. So you have to be careful of those sort of time-wise yeah. shifts as well. Then, then we have the trial data and I suppose a lot of that's good because it's standardized, the clinical data collection standardized, the investigations are standardized. But the only issue, we have to, well, one of the issues we have to be careful of is how applicable is that to another population? Is that, is that a very selected population? So you may not have re adequate representation of ethnic groups. And for us, particularly in chronic diseases, that's an issue. Yeah. Because there'd be certain ethnicities are prone to certain diseases which may not be represented in that clinical trial data set. Um, so those are sort of things we're aware of. Um, Actually, the only thing actually with clinical trials, there's been um, socioeconomic actually is an issue too. There's maybe certain people just don't get onto the trials. Yeah. Um, and then put on top of that lifestyle issues, which may be in certain groups and others. So there's quite a lot of things to think about. And I think it's put back to the point of artificial intelligence. It'll only ever be as good as the data that goes in. Yeah. Yeah. So we have to have sort of safeguards that it isn't making decisions on the wrong thing, which can happen by accident. So it's just something we're aware of in, in this sort of space. Well, it's worth realizing yeah. that in the context of, for example, wearable technologies or social mm -hmm. media platforms, yeah. they're actually facilitating access to clinical trials. So yeah. y y yes, you're no question, that will always be the case. The quality of the data that goes in is important, but I think there are increasing ways in which people can engage with research yeah. that, that maybe weren't there even 10 years ago that'll hopefully alleviate some of those problems. Yeah. yeah. So I think we're probably all agreed that there's um, a lot of progress that's been made over the last um, number of years, but there's still plenty of scope, I think, for, for improving that and making things even better, I guess, for the future. Now, one of the things I'd like to return to is, is when we think about um, actually uh, the methodologies or the technologies as well that are at our disposal because they have also changed, I think, a lot over the last years, decades. So what do you see as the kind of tools that are really going to revolutionize, I suppose, the way in which we can hopefully glean more data out of these uh, sample sets that we've got? Where, where do you get most excited? So Richard, maybe I'll take that to you first, thinking about it from the diagnostic perspective as well. well I'm just going to put a bit of a dampener on that question because uh, <laughs> I've been around, I think, in molecular biology for 20 years, and we're only really seeing like, the DNA tests coming in. So, uh, you know, it's a, we're, we're, there's a, always a big gap between the sort of original discovery and the excitement of actually becoming the real thing in the clinic. Um, you know, certainly in cancer, there's not that many DNA tests still being run. We're only seeing the panels being cleared by the regulatory authorities now. You know, because they've been around a long time. Yeah. Um, even but further behind that, we've got RNA, gene expression. Yeah. Now that, that's, um, that's 25 years old. And now, and now we're seeing just the first assays coming into clinical trials um, in, in chronic disease. I think we're running one in rheumatoid arthritis, for instance, from synovial biopsies. Mm -hmm. But it's been around a long time. So there's still work to do with the existing technologies to get them appropriate for regular clinical trial use, or sorry, clinical use, even beyond trial. Um, actually, an interesting point too is even some of those technologies, even though they've been around a long time, the reagents are still research use yeah. level, not actually clinical grade use. So there's a lot of issues even using them in a, in a reproducible manner within the clinic. So that's sort of the dampener bit. Um, sort of technologies we see coming online, which I think are interesting, there's the epigenetics, obviously. Yeah. Um, DNA methylation, that's going to be very important for chronic disease, um, where you have lifestyle change or, or other effects, uh, environmental effects. So you, you may see different patterns in, in the epigenetic um, biopsies of, say, again, synovium or yeah. colon. Or, um, we see, um, finally, after, again, many, many years, we're beginning to see the multi-proteomic uh, type signatures appearing um, by, by mass spec, and there's quite a lot of drive into those, those are now going into phase one trials. So that's an improvement. Um, digital pathology is now coming online. And so we're getting to the point now where the likes of um, inflammatory bowel disease can be biopsied. And a digital interpretation can subset that, not just into Crohn's or, inf or uh, ulcerative colitis, but into other subsets of those as well. And actually just, just last month, I believe, there's a publication in rheumatoid arthritis being subclassified by digital pathology. Mm -hmm. So you can see how these could begin to feed into stratified medicine, mm -hmm. where, where this is just being done in what's a relatively straightforward manner. 
Um, it's already been touched on by the, the wearable technologies. Uh, we're very interested in those because you're getting, as you mentioned, fast readout from clinical trials and people at home. So it's real time. It's not just a single measurement now. It can be done over a period of time. So that gets around some of the issues or you might get a sort of a spurious end point with somebody coming to a clinic and having a single measurement. Um, although it creates issues for us as well because then we have to find ways to develop or to deliver drugs mm -hmm. at home. And the one other thing I think is worth mentioning, it's sort of technology because it takes technology to deliver it, but I think something that is probably better done still in the oncology space, but probably needs to come more into the chronic disease space is the umbrella trial, yeah. um, where I think there's still a bit of a tendency to have a, sort of a single drug, single trial in the chronic space, whereas I think certainly in oncology, it's much more efficient to have a, a disease and then segregate into multiple different drugs, depending on your biomarker, it's a more efficient approach. So this is just a few of the things we're seeing coming on. Yeah, yeah. George, do you, what, yeah. Exci what exciting technologies do you see that are going to be really transformative, I suppose, maybe over the next few years? <clears throat> In the particular diseases that we uh, study, um, I think the thing that will be most interesting over the next um, short period of time probably will be spatial transcriptomics of, um, mm -hmm. of liver tissue. Um, and, and this has already been touched on, actually, that, you know, we deal with autoimmune liver diseases by and large in, in our clinic. Um, if we do transcriptional profiling of um, peripheral immune cells, we can identify signatures that distinguish um, subgroups of patients who may respond better or worse to different treatments and have different disease trajectories. But of course, this is just an echo of what's actually happening inside the liver, where everything is, uh, where the inflammation is, um, is focused. And, and we know from conditions like rheumatoid arthritis that actually the real signatures uh, are in the synovium. Yes. Um, but um, getting a liver biopsy and uh, segregating or disaggregating the liver biopsy into the different compartments, cellular compartments, so that you can profile each of those compartments is actually very, very difficult, whereas the ability of tr spatial transcriptomics to profile those different compartments from paraffin-embedded tissue is, uh, is going to be transformative, I would have thought. So that, that's something that I'm pretty excited about um, over the next few years. Um, the other thing, of course, is, is the machine learning and the artificial yeah. intelligence. Yeah. Um, in reality, we can already make um, very accurate predictions about um, patient outcomes uh, um, using the standard measurements that we already have. Um, and um, it's part of the work that we've done over the last few years is to develop um, uh, predictive models um, using conventional Cox proportional hazard models and so on, which are very accurate. They have area under curves of greater than 0.8, for example, for outcomes of the next five or ten years. That's just based on our routine measurements that we do um, in the clinic. Now, if we, can, if we can actually use more sophisticated means of modeling standard clinical data, then we can improve the accuracy, I would have thought, um, even above that. Um, so, so that's another area that I think will be um, extremely interesting uh, over the next few years. And, and Owen, your thoughts? Yeah, it's, um, at a risk of echoing that, I make two points. One, uh, which I think highlights the potential and another that highlights the risk. So the, from the potential perspective, uh, machine learning methods unquestionably of the, of the ability to transform the way in which we, we approach precision medicine so far, mostly because some of the newer neural network based deep learning methods allow us to approach not just data at a single snapshot or time point, but allow us to take the entire journey of an individual uh, and take into account what happened to them 10 years ago and how that might impact on what's happening now. Uh, and that's effectively what we do as clinicians. When I see someone in clinic, I try and weigh up for this individual sitting in front of me. How should I respond and treat them? And that can be done systematically with some of the newer methods. So that's got huge potential. From a technology perspective, we increasingly have the ability to measure not one or two things that we think might be interesting in the samples. Mm -hmm. So in the context where I don't know what to measure, we don't have to say, well, I think this might be important, so I'm gonna measure it. Now we can measure everything, mm -hmm. whether that be in gene expression, whether that be in genetic variants, uh, epigenetic variants, so changes in the, in, in the DNA backbone. Um, however, that comes with a risk. The more things we measure, the more likely we are to find a result <laughs> yeah. that works. Yeah. And not just one that works, one that works really well yeah. on the samples that I happen to have selected to profile. 
So if I measure 200 samples and 50,000 measurements, I'm very likely to find a pattern that perfectly predicts outcome for these patients. The key thing is that that does not necessarily mean it's going to work on the next 200 patients. And it's that part that we're still bad at. It's, it's building models that will generalize to, to patients that are not in our discovery set. Uh, and unfortunately, in academic medicine, we're very guilty of, of aiming for the goalposts, which is a nice paper, a nice publication. And you can very easily come up with a perfectly performing predictor that can get past reviewers, but it's not going to get past, uh, it's not going to get into medicine. It's not going to get used unless it actually works. And that's the bit we have to focus on. It's that translational step. Fantastic. And we'll return to that one, I think, in a minute. Adam, I'll just get your thoughts then on, on, on what technologies or Great, shifts thanks. might yeah. help. Well, I totally agree with my learned colleagues on the, you know, the plethora of uh, different technologies and different approaches we talked about. There's nothing there I disagree with. So, so I'll go a bit more low-tech. Um, <laughs> one of the things I said before was um, we, we talked about having to be able to access the lungs without accessing the lungs. And yeah. perhaps a, you know, a silver lining to the COVID-19 pandemic is people got used to putting sticks up their nose. And uh, <laughs> there is something we found recently in terms of nasal absorption, putting a stick up the nose, taking some of uh, the mucosal lining and actually analyzing proteins in RNA. And actually they seem to correlate, some of them, not all of them, some of them seem to correlate very well what's going on in lungs. So it's perhaps a way we can start accessing the target tissue uh, going forwards. Um, I think the other thing as well, which is perhaps um, a, a high-tech approach to, to a low-tech problem, is we have chronic cough as one of our disease areas as well. And it's not only a disease in its own right that these poor people cough up hundreds of times per, per hour. Um, it's also um, seems to pervade most chronic respiratory illness as well. And so um, there is only one FDA-approved uh, cough counting device, which is a big clunky thing here. And generally, when you get a recording, you have to manually create how many mm. coughs are and then sort of multiply them up once you've, you, you've worked it out for an hour. So we've actually put a machine learning algorithm in, in place to try and identify when somebody's coughing from a recording so you can pull that out. So again, machine learning coming in to try and solve uh, what is a relatively low-tech problem as well. Fantastic. So I'm going to return now to the sort of topic that... Owen was, was alluding to, which is, if, even if we find these, these markers, these magic markers that will help us to identify those patients, so let's assume that we've managed to find some good ones, and we want to implement them into the patient journey. Um, again, we've got to think about, well, what's it going to take to make sure that actually we get that kind of testing paradigm established so where do we see the challenges? Where do we see the opportunities? And where do we see is the things that we maybe need to change in order to make biomarker testing and the patient paradigm for precision medicine really work in the chronic diseases? So Owen, maybe I'll start with you on that one. Okay, um, I'll pick up on a few little things maybe. Uh, I think where we traditionally think about translating something, and by that I mean... I've found something, now I want to take it and try and use it in clinical practice. Usually the point where people think of that is the point where they find it. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is cool. Maybe this could be used in the clinic. Yeah. Uh, and unfortunately that's too late. I think we have to consider that and take it into account at the very beginning of our experiment because actually the thing that you find and the way in which you find it can often dictate how easy it is to translate. So I'll give you a sim simple example. If I go out and measure every gene that's switched on in some tissues and I'm looking at differences between people with and without disease, I'll get a list, let's say a few hundred genes that are differentially expressed. I might be able to use those to tell the difference between people who have the disease and those who don't. Uh, but if I want to turn that into a test, mm -hmm. I may not be able to use the same technology that I measure the genes, perhaps sequencing, as easily in the clinic. I may have to hop onto an easier technology, something that might be able to be used in a stick that you can pop up your nose. Uh, but in order to make that hop, I might have to only consider the genes that are more highly expressed, mm -hmm. which means there's only a subset of those that might be useful. So I think you have to consider at the very earliest stages of your experiment where you ultimately might want to go with it. And that influences how you do your analysis. It influences how you process the samples. It influences what measurements you take. And I think we're guilty in academic medicine of not thinking that far ahead. Yeah. Uh, and again, I think that's changing with greater awareness and greater uh, emphasis put on translation. So it's not just the publication, but actually if you can have impact with your research, that gets more rewarded these days and it's, it's, it's given greater credence. So hopefully that continues to change in the right direction. 
Now, I'm going to bring this to Richard because actually it's touched on a few themes that I think actually are really quite important as we start to think about, you know, those technologies that can actually be used in the clinic with the patient sitting in front of you. And to Adam's point about, well, what are you going to actually take as a sample? You can't ask a patient to perhaps undergo an invasive procedure. So what are the sorts of things that we can be thinking about in the diagnostic space? Yeah, so um, to answer sort of, first of all, sort of sample type um, for for the genotyping, obviously the SNP type work, a lot of that can be just done from like a buckle okay. swab. Um, you even need that. You know, traditionally, we've used white cells from blood, but that's not even necessary. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty straightforward. Um, you know, other biomarkers can be reasonably easily done. So urinary biomarkers, you can do DNA, RNA, protein from that. And there's a whole stack of things not getting into you can do from blood. Mm -hmm. But it comes back to practicality. And I suppose, you know, when we're delivering, delivering our, a biomarker strategy, um, you know, what are we thinking of? We're thinking kind of the analytically validated. Mm -hmm. And that's because we, we, we work under the regulatory authorities, the EU, the US FDA, Japanese <laughs> authorities. Um, so there's an expectation that this must be a robust technology. It has to be, just to your own point, it has to be reproducible. That's the precision there, but we also have to be able to show that it works in an independent data set to the data set it was trained in, because overfitting is so well recognized. Mm -hmm. So all that has to be planned up front, and you can go badly off course, as I yeah. said, right up front in a, in a technology that maybe sounds really good in the lab academically, but actually comes to the practicalities of delivering a reproducible cost-effective test, it's just not going to work. Yeah. Um, quite often, we, our, our model is to partner with companies and sometimes they'll have brought what they think is a really cool biomarker. And it's brilliant, the papers are fantastic and you can't argue with it. But it might take about two months to deliver the test and no clinician is that patient. And you know, about 30,000 pounds or something per sample, so that's not going to work. Okay. So there's a, there's a pragmatic part to all this as well. So we're always thinking about that. Um, and then actually, even once you get through all that, there's another whole piece, um, which can be a challenge, is actually who's got to pay for it? Yeah. And uh, that has not really been well decided. Um, there's a lot of different standards in different regions in the world. You know, the US, it's insurance companies in Europe, depending on which state you're in or which region. It might be a, it might be a government, it might be, a, might be an insurance company, it might be both. And that's really challenging, because you have to work at each country in a different model. Okay. And that, that can really hold things back. So there, there are a lot of challenges to, to get these things forward. And the last thing you really need is a test that's going to hold back the drug. So you know, we, we're very aware of that. But just to say, there's a lot of challenges to this still. And, yeah. and George, thinking about the patient perspective, the clinical perspective as well, yeah. additional yeah. Th thoughts um, from I, you? From the clinical perspective, I, th I think you, you identify with this question actually some, a, a real challenge. Um, I'm going to give you a, a simple example, a current day example. We already try to risk stratify um, a disease, the, the disease I treat, primary biliary cholangitis. And we can do that in, in, in a simple way or in a complex way. The simple way is that we look at a test called the alkaline phosphatase. If it's greater than 200, that's high risk. If it's less than 200, that's low risk. Or we can do it in a complicated way, which is to use a multivariable risk prediction model based on Cox proportion hazard modeling, et cetera. Okay. What, is, what have people adopted? Well, they've adopted the simple one, yeah. obviously, even though it's considerably less accurate than the multivariable model. Okay, that's fine. Um, has it been universally adopted and recognized throughout the UK? Well, I can tell you the answer to that because we've just completed an audit of the management of primary biliary cholangitis in the UK. And I can tell you that, um, that uh, in about 5% um, of, of patients, of all patients, which is a fairly a substantial proportion, um, high-risk disease, alkaline phosphatase, more than this simple measurement of 200, wasn't recognized by the physicians treating the patient. Now, you can't get simpler than an alkaline phosphatase greater than 200, because this is a very well-established test which we've been using for decades. Um, so the more complicated we make medicine, the more likely we are to simply get it wrong, not because the tests haven't been well validated, uh, not because they don't work in diverse populations, but simply because we, we forget to use them or we don't know how to interpret them. Um, and I guess healthcare therefore needs to recognize this issue and we may need diagnostic pathways, which mean that you know, complicated yeah. patients end up in specialist centers where people who are extremely familiar with these tests are interpreting them and guiding the treatment. 
or we set up networked uh, multidisciplinary teams where all clinicians get together, discuss complicated patients, and advice is given from a central service. I don't really know, but it is an issue which needs to be recognised. Yeah. So let's return to some of those themes in a minute, because I think there's actually a couple of topics that we could touch on further. Um, but Adam, I'll just come to you just for, for your thoughts around, you know, making things fit into the translating yeah. things, I guess, from, from discovery into the patient yeah. journey. Well, once again, you know, I just totally agree with my colleagues here, um, uh, particularly around the importance of pre-analytics, um, uh, the importance of getting into the clinical care pathway and have that final line of sight to the diagnostic. I think the other things probably from my end when we're starting to go into clinical studies is how do you actually set a threshold for a biomarker? Mm -hmm. So is it, actually, where is that level? And we, we look at external big cohorts, but obviously they're a little bit skewed in some directions, perhaps. And it might even be the age of the samples is an issue. Yeah. Uh, and you're actually getting a slightly aberrant uh, 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 signal compared to some you measure on the spot. Um, so that's one thing. I think the other thing as well is, is the difference in different populations. So a lot of the genetic propositions we base ourselves around, like UK Biobank, are pro 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 prominently European Caucasians. So what happens if we launch an asthma drug based on that in China? How do we understand the genetics in China there? So I think these are the sort of things which, which we're starting to understand by building bigger databases, but it's certainly something if we're going to make precision medicine a reality in chronic disease, we need to take more account of. Thanks. So we've, we've touched on quite a few topics, but let's just pick up on a couple of things that were mentioned when we were talking about that. So one of the things was about simplicity of testing and, and also interpretability of testing. So when the physician gets the result back, they need to make sure they know what to do and how to do it. And, and I guess that's always been a challenge as well, making things simple enough, but also making the education there well enough that they understand what do you do with this report. And we've seen this in oncology where the complexity of some of the reports that come back to physicians around the molecular profile of a particular tumour can leave them a little bamboozled as well, what should I do for my patient? So how do we tackle some of that? And then one of the other things that Richard mentioned was around um, how do we make the testing accessible in terms of it's easy to be able to get it paid for, so therefore it's not a barrier. So how do we tackle some of these things? So Owen, maybe I'll come to you first with that one. So great points. Uh, from a simplicity perspective, it's probably worth just pulling apart the fact that uh, what we're trying to do with the sort of complicated methods that many people are alluding to is to engineer simplicity. Yeah. So your methods to get there can be very complex, you know, machine learning, artificial intelligence, it could be complex mathematical models. The way in which that is implemented has to be simple, yeah. partly because it's not going to work if it isn't, because it'll have to work on a wet Tuesday night in a small di district general hospital in the middle of nowhere. So it has to be simple to have that reproducibility and validity. So if we try and engineer something that's complex, that will fall over, so it can't be. But the way in which you can get a simple test is often very complex, and that's fine. Uh, so simplicity, absolutely. Interpretability, it's important, again, to pull apart different types of interpretability. So the interpretability of a test to a clinician has to be utterly clear, and I think that overlaps with simplicity. There has to be a very clear result that can be easily interpreted, i.e. I know what it means, but also I know what it means in terms of what I should do next. Yeah. High risk, low risk, treat differently. Uh, interpretability has another interpretation, which is that, uh, for example, if I'm measuring 10 proteins, that tell me whether someone's going to have a particular relapse of disease in the future, does it matter what those 10 proteins are? Do I have to understand why the marker is associated with the disease? That's a slightly different meaning of interpretability. And on one level, of course, come back to your toenails comment, it doesn't really matter. If measuring your toenails tells you the information you yeah. want, measure the toenails. <laughs> yeah. But at the same time, these are more complex patterns of, of genes and proteins. And if we can understand those patterns, it does two things. It gives us a better handle on how we might manipulate them with no novel treatments. It also gives clinicians more confidence in the fact that the result is right. If I can un understand not just that I am predicting the right endpoint, but if I can understand why that test works, I think that adds a lot. Uh, so I think we, we can't ignore those different types of interpretability. They're both important. Yeah, good points. And, and George, from your perspective as well? Yeah, 
I don't think I have a simple answer to these questions, actually. Um, and uh, in, in reality, I think uh, it's an area that requires a huge amount of, yeah. of research, quite separate from the, uh, the research that needs to be done to generate the tests in the first place. Um, <clears throat> what is an example? In liver transplantation, probably in renal transplantation as well, actually, but in, certainly in liver transplantation, we um, uh, have the option of, um, of, of well, the, the, the selection of patients is now based on something known as a transplant benefit score, yeah. which essentially uh, weighs the, the risk to the patient of not receiving that liver mm -hmm. um, and the benefit to the patient of receiving the liver. Yeah that is being offered. And that, that, uh, that is calculated for every patient who's waiting for a liver transplant across the entire country, and the person who scores highest uh, gets the liver. It's a very complicated formula that sits behind mm -hmm. it. There is no way that any transplant physician or transplant surgeon in the middle of the night is going to be able to work out what is being calculated. So what ends up happening, actually, is that uh, an algorithm says, yeah. this is who should have the liver, and we say, OK. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> there's nothing yeah. wrong with that. It's simple, yeah. we, we act on it, but it's potentially too simple. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think, I, I, I accept the point that we need to simplify things so that people basically end up with a yes, no, but my fear actually is that, is that all physicians can cope with it, uh, you know, on a rainy Tuesday in a district general hospital or wherever it happens to be, that all we can cope with is yes, no's. Um, and I'm not sure that that quite matches with what we're trying to achieve with personalized medicine. I, I think yeah. it's very complicated, actually. Um, how do you convert all of this work that we're doing at the moment into, into something that is truly personalized for the patient? Yeah, mm -hmm. complexity. Yeah. Adam, uh, thoughts guess, from you? Yeah, I guess the only thing I can think of is if, if we're going to make precision medicine a reality in chronic disease, the value proposition has to be incredibly strong. It's no good having an incremental improvement. You actually have to make the case that this is something driven by physicians. Uh, this, is, this is something that patients want, and payers are going to pay for the extra value it brings. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I think that's the thing probably we've also learned from oncology in recent years. Yeah. Could I pick up on one thing that George said that I think is quite important, uh, which is whether or not someone can interpret and understand the result of an algorithm. And this yeah. will become increasingly important as machine learning and AI uh, yeah. engages further with medicine. At one level, you have black box systems that are so-called because they are algorithms that can give you an answer and no one knows why. Yeah. And so neural network models work on this, many of them work on this system in that they intermesh a large amount of data and give an answer that we have to trust. And in fact, it's such a complex interrelationship of the different variables that go in that it's impossible to unpick what caused what and how that result was attained. There are white box systems whereby you can understand how the different features come together to give you that answer. And I don't think it's necessary for you to understand how those features go together in order to use the answer. It might say, do this, do that. And if I'm woken up in the middle of the night to, to give, a, res to, to give a, a clinical opinion and I have the test result, yes, no, as long as that test result is interpretable yeah. in the past, in other words, it can be understood. It doesn't necessarily have to be understood at the point of use. And that's probably quite an important distinction to make. I also think the black box models where it is impossible to dive in are hugely risky. Yeah. Uh, and, and we don't understand enough about what, it is, what they are doing and how they get to their result. Uh, and they, they are at particularly high risk of things like information leak, where they can uh, appear to give a result that's better than it really should be, for example. Yeah, yeah. And, and Richard, I guess in the diagnostic field, you've got some thoughts on this one as well? Yes, um, actually, what we, what we find really helpful is to talk to the patients um, <laughs> about how, how to discuss this kind of data. Um, so I'll give you an example. We, we did an ASI a few years ago, which gave a continuous risk score. Um, the clinical advisory panel all wanted the continuum because they wanted the numbers. They didn't <laughs> want to be told yes or no. Now, ultimately, most clinical decisions are dichotomous. It's give the drug or not. But they like to have the score in order to sort of see all the information. Um, and we discussed it with the patients. They didn't like that at all. Um, because what they said is if it was 20% risk or 70% risk getting a disease, all they could think about was 50-50 statistically because they could think flip of a coin meant something to them. But to get that, those sort of numbers to be meaningful to them was very difficult. Yeah. So actually, what, what we ended up doing was to try and keep everybody happy, was to have a scale. 
And then pretty much where the decision function was marked on it, and like a red and a green area, and where they were in that. Yeah. So everybody was happy, but that actually worked quite well because they could visually interpret where they were. But that actually came from the patients themselves. So it was their idea about how they would understand their risk. So I think there is a piece that can be done just with consultation with, with patient advisory groups. Yeah. So yeah. Lo lots that could be done in this space. Yeah. Um, I'm very conscious of the time and, and I know that we have an audience with us today and, and I've been firing all the questions at you, but I think we ought to just give the audience a couple of minutes to perhaps take a question or two um, to you if that's okay. So if I may, I'll pass to the audience. Hi there. Hi. Um, collaboration between patient groups, pharmaceutical companies, health providers, and, um, and diagnostic organizations. How important will that be going forward to make progress in this area? Yeah. All right. I guess it's a wide question to any, any of the panel. <laughs> well, just, just as a starter, um, if you want to have access to good clinical data, you need the patients on board because there's a great suspicion about providing uh, clinical information, particularly to commercial bodies. So I think a clear understanding of why it's being done and what the benefits are to the patients is important. So I think you must have the patients on board. Um, and then I think certainly the best, best biomarker programs we've been involved with have involved pharmaceutical partner, diagnostic company, and academia, all working together and look, tackling the same problem. Because you've got unique, unique aspects, unique views on how it should be developed. So to answer the question, all of them together, but valuing the different contributions of each. And any other, uh, one more question perhaps, given our time? Hello. Thanks for that, that was really interesting. My um, question is, uh, Ian, you talked about kind of what you'd like to see, like the, the goal for you as a paper, that they're changing that to like, making that translational. What would you like to see from pharma and then maybe for Adam and Maria, what would you like to see from academics? What, are the, what is the one thing you go, ooh, that's where we should be going? Good question. Great question. Um, what was the one thing I'd like to see from pharma? The one, many things. Uh, <laughs> one of those, I think, uh, once a clinical trial has been done, I'm just throwing out an example here, but I think this would push things fast. When a clinical trial is done, you get an answer. Should I use this drug? How useful is it going to be? Yes, no. End of story. Move on. It doesn't have to be like that, of course, because if you've conducted your clinical trial in such a way that you've stratified and collected extensive clinical data, you've got appropriate biosampling throughout, actually, it's not just a trial. It's a huge resource to improve the next round of trials. So I think there's huge scope for academic collaboration with drug companies who've undertaken these trials, where, whereby we can learn. And in fact, perhaps the best places to learn are where the trials don't work, where perhaps they might have worked for a subgroup of those patients. And I think that represents a huge resource of data and samples. And I think pharma, correct me if I'm wrong, I've been alive to this possibility for years and I've been collecting samples assiduously. So I think there's huge scope for collaboration in that context. Yeah, and I'll just give a perspective from when I, I think you're absolutely right and it comes back as well to a lot of what we were talking about right at the beginning is collaboration is key because actually the problem is is big we, we've talked about just some of the topics today that we need to solve in order to make precision medicine work in chronic disease and I think the only way in which we can tackle all of the various pieces that are involved in that is through really strong collaborations the clinical community the academic community the diagnostic community the pharma community and the questions are how do we do that even stronger now to make sure that we use every piece of data, we use every sample that we've got and we make sure that we glean absolutely everything from that in order to benefit the patients at the end of the day. That for me would be absolute heaven. Yeah, I, I think I'll just build on that and say I think over the last probably 10 years, we've seen a lot more availability of big data sets. And UK Biobank is a great example of that, but there are 
many others as well. And, and I think that, that's the sort of area we, we need to be digging more into is, is be able to collate, I think as you were saying at the beginning, is the, the collection of um, medical records across loads of uh, patients, making sure they're anonymised so the patient is protected, but they do become available for everybody to, to research. And again, to Richard's point, the best collaborations I've been involved in is where everybody's come together as equal partners in that collaboration. Everyone's roles are known and everybody brings something to the party. So I, I think it's, it's started to happen, but we can certainly do it better. So that's for sure. Fantastic. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, I know we're up on our time today. Uh, what I would like to do, though, is to say a big thank you to my panel today. Uh, it's been an absolutely fantastic discussion. And actually, we could have continued this, I think, for another hour or two. There were plenty of topics. But um, many thanks for joining today. And I hope the audience have enjoyed listening to some of uh, making precision medicine work in chronic diseases. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.